Israel played a major role in what is called the World Anti-Communist League. And the World Anti-Communist League was a non-governmental organization of communist politicians and groups in 1952. This is after World War II. This is after the creation of the State of Israel. The State of Israel knew that it had to fund anti-communism because communists are fundamentally against imperialism and Zionism, and which the State of Israel is an imperialist Zionist project. I think that in order to define anti-communism, we first have to define imperialism. And imperialism can date back to the late 1800s, but in 1917, Lenin, Vladimir Lenin, the leader of the Russian Revolution, wrote a, a beautiful pamphlet called Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism. And he wrote this on the eve of the Russian Revolution, where he described imperialism as the formation of oligopoly, the interlacing of bank and industrial capital, creating a financial oligarchy, the banking monopoly elites who run the world, JP Morgan, the IMF, the World Bank, these financial institutions that surpass the industrial capitalists because within the capitalist class the, the the ruling economic class you have the industrial capitalist people who make who own factories and own the means of production with imperialism you have a higher stage you have aig you have the major insurance companies hsbc the bank that funded the opium wars in china you have these financial institutions that don't even create a product and are doing what's called money magic. They're using numbers and crunching numbers to make profits around the world on economies in the global south, and they run the entire world. And this is what Lenin outlined in imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism. And obviously, the socialist and communist movement has fought very fiercely against imperialism and has been the fiercest attackers of, of imperialism. And I think one example that is crucial to understanding imperialism and its connections with anti-communism is something that's not really talked about within the left. And that is the role of racism uh, and more particularly of Zionism. And just as we've mentioned uh, red scare and black scare, uh, just as much as the US government was fearful and was racist and was very segregationist and enslaved Africans and, and black and brown people in the, in the US, we can also apply this to Palestine and the creation of the state of Israel, the quote unquote state of Israel. And this is important to, to mention and to learn about because when we understand the role of Zionism, I think Zionism is a great example of the interconnection between anti-communism and imperialism. We can begin to understand why today the quote unquote state of Israel continues to expand on stolen Palestinian territory, why evangelical right-wing pro-Israel presidents in the US from Bolsonaro to Juan Orlando Hernandez in Honduras to Duque to so many others are supporting US foreign policy in Israel. And this all goes back to the same year that Lenin published Imperialism, the Highest Age of Capitalism, 1917, the Sykes-Pico Agreement, which was a secret treaty between the UK and France, which basically carved up what was then the Ottoman Empire after World War I. And the Soviet Union, the first socialist republic, the first socialist country in the world, was the first nation to expose that. And the Sykes-Pico Agreement was backed by the World Zionist Organization. It was declared by Mark Sykes, who was a conservative party politician from the UK. He was backed by the World Zionist Organization and he drafted the Balfour Declaration, which basically called for a quote, national home for the Jewish people. Of course, we know it doesn't truly represent the Jewish people, but instead represents only the international financial elites who sought to use occupied Palestine as the new banking capital of global international capitalism. And the Soviet Union, by exposing this, it essentially what it did is it garnered anger and solidarity among the Arab nations to resist Zionism, to resist Israel, the 1948 Arab-Israeli war. And the Soviet Union and the communists have always been on the side of anti-Zionism, of anti-imperialism, because fundamentally Zionism is based on this racist idea 
that Palestinians and Arabs are subhuman, that they don't belong on their own land, and that others should go and settle there. And later on, this is, it's really interesting, because I think this is part of a history that's not really talked about. Toward the 1950s, Israel played a major role in what is called the World Anti-Communist League. And the World Anti-Communist League was a non-governmental organization of communist politicians and groups in 1952. This is after World War II. This is after the creation of the State of Israel. The State of Israel knew that it had to fund anti-communism because communists are fundamentally against imperialism and Zionism, and which the State of Israel is an imperialist Zionist project. And the World Anti-Communist League was founded by Chiang Kai-shek, the leader of the Republic of Taiwan, which is part of China, which is essentially part of the People's Republic of China, occupied China. And also um, another representative of the World Anti-Communist League was Sigmund Rhee of the Republic of Korea. And Sigmund Rhee was an evangelical right-wing, pro-US, pro-UK, pro-Israel imperialist who is responsible for the deaths of at least 100,000 people, the Jeju massacre in 1948. A lot of things were happening at this time and the World Anti-Communist League with the support of Israel was attacking communists. And so at this point, after World War II, after the Soviet victory, when communism was extremely popular, everyone in the world wanted to build socialism, two tendencies emerged. There was the openly right-wing fascist evangelical pro-Israel tendency embodied by the World Anti-Communist League, right? These are the people who supported the, the Contras in Iran. These are the people who supported Guatemalan right-wing dictator Efraín Ríos Montt and Reagan, who murdered indigenous peoples by the thousands, murdered Palestinians. Then you have another wing, which I think is a more dangerous wing, in my opinion, and this is the liberal, imperialist, social, democratic, anti-communist wing embodied by the Congress for Cultural Freedom, an anti-communist advocacy group founded in the 1950s. The Congress for Cultural Freedom was active in 35 countries, and the CIA was supporting it for many years. They funded postmodernism. They funded what they called anti-authoritarian studies. Some of the major leaders were Sidney Hook and Irving Kristol. Sidney Hook was what he called himself a pragmatic social democrat. He worked with the CIA. He also, interestingly enough, worked for the ACLU. And he is somebody who called for openly, and he's, he called for trials against communists in the US. He said they were anti-democratic and that communists should be punished by the US government. And this is somebody who called himself a socialist. Irving Kristol, an American journalist who was known as the godfather of neoconservatism, uh, a former Trotskyite, and he also was a supporter of Israel and Zionism. And they also supported the Frankfurt School, which promoted this anti-communist, postmodern liberal approach that, okay, cap we know capitalism and imperialism are bad, but so is socialism, so is communism. And that was a very useful and effective weapon that manifested and, and, and gained a lot of hold in the 1980s with the color revolutions, with the overthrow of the Soviet Union, and to this day remains the dominant and most threatening form of anti-communism, which we're seeing play out today as the comrade, as comrade Erica mentioned earlier, they're using it right now against Nicaragua. They're saying that the opposition, the right wing Contras are pro-democracy freedom fighters are saying Ortega's a dictator. They're saying the same about Venezuela and Cuba. They're appropriating the images, the iconography of the anti-imperialist left and using it for imperialism. So these are more or less the two tendencies within anti-communism, the right-wing evangelical, openly fascist sector, and then the liberal social imperialist hipster faction that I like to call it. And I just wanted to kind of mention that from the beginning, because I think it's important to attack both. This is a two-headed snake that we're talking about. 